Hello and welcome. If you're watching this right now, you're watching the replay because no one's live yet, on live yet, but I'm so glad that you're here. Um, today's chat is a featured designer chat with Carol of KC Knitting Co. So I'm really excited. Um, if you're new around here, I am Jessica of Snickerdoodle Knits and I I host a designer every month. So like I said this week, this month we are talking with Carol of KC Knitting Co. Um, and I really like to take a peek in to the designers beyond just being just <laughs> being knitters and designers. Um, so we like to talk about life beyond knitting, but then also a bunch of their details about how they got started knitting and designing and why they enjoy it and all of that. So we I see Carol is here now. Um, I have to get right, Carol. Um, and beyond that, hello. Hi. <laughs> I, I always have to adjust. <laughs> I thought I put it higher and it still wasn't high enough so anyway I'm so excited that you're here yeah thank you yes um so thanks everybody also joining us live it's always fun to have folks listening in and interacting so feel free to pop in your comments and your questions and all of that stuff too um and if you have to leave early the replay will be available too so there's that. I was going to share one quick little announcement because the doors to the design circle are open all month this month. Um, I haven't been talking about it much on Snickerdoodle Knits, so I thought I'd make the announcement here because um, I talk more about it on the pattern design circle. But just FYI, if anybody's been thinking about the design circle, doors are open all month because we have the design along this month. So anyway, what we're actually here to talk about is Carol. So, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I've never done a live before, so I'm like, oh, we're, all this stuff is on the screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, welcome to the world of lives. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> My mom's here. <laughs> um, okay, so my first question for you is, rather than asking you to describe yourself and everything you do what are three words you would use to describe yourself oh my gosh um that's, that's <laughs> um i would say i've always been a dreamer mm -hmm. um and that i guess that means a lot of things but um there's, there's, I guess in the word dreamer, there's like hope and love and optimism and idealism all wrapped up in that. Mm -hmm. um, and so dreamer or dreamy and um, definitely passionate. Um, there's a real depth that, oh my God, I'm going to cry. Um, there's a real depth that I see in life and, and this existence and, and what we're blessed with to be here and um it it almost seems like i i can't help but be very much in existence you know mm -hmm. um and then maybe a third one would be um thoughtful um so there's always there's always like what's happening and what you're observing and then there's um different angles to understand them um, and I think there's so much interest in that. Yeah, I'm so glad I asked that question because <laughs> that's like actually, that's like the purpose of these calls is to like mm -hmm. dig in deeper. And I feel like when you just ask somebody to introduce themselves, it's like just a surface level. Hi, I'm this person. I live in this place and this is what I do. I design these right. kind of patterns. Um, but like who you actually are is more like those words that you just described. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I love that. Thank you for playing along. And for, oh, sure. thank you for asking and for, for obviously touching something in me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
now I'm like, I have so many different ways. I, I've listed out <laughs> the questions I was going to ask, but I kind of want to to go talk about the dreamer part real quick. Um, or it doesn't have to be real quick. Let's start there anyway. <laughs> um, so have you always been like an artsy, creative kind of dreamer, like as a child and all of that? Yeah, yeah. It's so funny. I like I know my mom's here and I'm like, Mom, do you want to chime in? Um, <laughs> so for as long as I can remember, I have been I love drawing, I love storytelling, make believe. <laughs> I've always had this very, very big imagination. Um, actually, one of my favorite anecdotes is um, and so I, I have two brothers, so I didn't have any sisters to play with, but I love girly things. And I would like I would like gallop around the backyard um, and pretend I was riding a horse. And my horse's name was Tresiferina. And I would just, I would just live in this fantasy world, you know? Um, and I would write these little stories. I would illustrate them. Um, I loved, um, what did I do when I was little? I loved sewing. Um, I loved all sorts of crafts. Um, I took all sorts of art classes and I think just always like had an idea of like there's there's like the life that I live where I like go to school and I you know do the kid thing and then there's like so much more and um, there was always an avenue to create that and explore that through writing and so that's really the, I think the first foray into creativity was through writing fiction. I love that. There yeah. are like parts to that where I can relate because I was very much into crafty hobby kind of stuff, but I never was like the artistic kind as far as like drawing and sketching and painting and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't have much of an imagination. So for the longest time, I didn't think that I could be artistic. I didn't think that I like could be creative when I first was, so I started my Etsy shop selling hand mitts and got bored with it pretty quickly. And I was like, um, basically there are two routes if I want to keep in the fiber industry that I knew of that I could go yarn dyeing or designing. And at that point we were still in college. I'm like, I don't have the finances or the space for yarn dyeing yeah. and I don't have the creativity for designing. So, <laughs> and then, you know, like two or three months later, I suddenly had a bazillion design ideas <laughs> and you know kibosh that whole idea but um I just love I don't know I love hearing about other people that it's like we're similar but at the same time we're very different and that's like what makes a whole community what it is because we're not all the same but we do have similarities yeah yeah that's so funny that the way that you would understand it was that you know that you weren't very, you were, you were crafty, but not, you didn't have an imagination, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's this duality, right, where I remember my mom used to always say, and she would say this in Chinese, I don't really know what the English translation would be, but she would talk about, like, my, like, dexterity, and she would say that my hands were very chiao, so that's the Chinese word, I guess it's the like deft, or, or dexterous, right, like, very good with your hands and I used to braid hair and now I'm remembering that um in high school I had my friends come over before dances and I would do their hair you know um and so there was that aspect of it and yet there was also this feeling of um me not being very mechanically talented you know like I couldn't I'm like like carpentry is not a thing that I can do right um and I always thought, oh, well, maybe I'm more into like the soft arts. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't have like this, this skill, this, 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 this dexterous skill, which I didn't even start, I didn't start knitting until like, I was almost 30. Um, I just never thought that it was something that I wanted to get into. Um, I can't even tell you what my opinion of it was. <laughs> before I started doing it other than <laughs> not for me not for me yeah yeah, yeah. so interesting um yeah I find it really interesting this is but I find it interesting how like all of the other 
artsy things. I have such a hard time what's in my head to become a reality. But like designing somehow, I was actually just thinking about this the other day. And I wonder if it's like, because I'm actually creating something in my head instead of based on what I see other people doing. Um, so it's like, I have this idea of how it's going to look and fill and the kind of textures, but I don't actually have the full picture in my head. And so then it works because I can then work it out as I'm designing it where, you know, like I'm used to seeing paintings that look like X, Y, Z and that, you know, I was just thinking about graphic design stuff the other day because we're working on a Kickstarter campaign for a book collaboration we're doing inside the design circle. And I'm like, I, I have such a hard time. Like, I know what I want, but I can't make it what I want. Um, so anyway, I just thought it was really interesting because I was just thinking about that the other day. And I think it's because, like, I'm so used to in the other arts trying to do other people's definition of what what is beautiful or things like that, where somehow I've given myself the flexibility in designing to do my vision. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and it also sounds like with with your design process, it's you start with a one piece of it and then as you build upon it, it becomes something that's mm -hmm. a whole, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. Whereas I think, I think, and that, I think that maybe that's a type of creative process and that sounds similar to mine. Um, whereas like, <laughs> although I started out my life drawing and I used to be a much better drawer, like I'm not a very good drawer now, but you know, I see other designers who have these like amazing sketches and I'm like, what, I don't even know. What did you do there? <laughs> Like, this just starts as a tiny little stitch pattern in my head, maybe, you know, or I have to actually make the swatch and play around with it. And then it'll just grow from there. Yeah. Um, rather than like having some idea of like, oh, this is the sweater I want to make like that. That hardly ever happens. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so maybe share, do you want to share a little more about your design process? Since that works, what we're talking about. Um, yeah. Or are you inspired? What are you inspired by? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm inspired by stories and feelings. Um, but that came a little bit later. I think when I first thought about designing, my like my first kind of rule was that I didn't want to design anything that already existed. You know, and so there, and, and there, I think there are different kinds of designers out there. There are designers who um, are this, where this is their livelihood. And I think maybe this is what your design journey is. Um, and so when you do that, you, you really want to have a base collection, right? And so like, I'll probably never design like a basic sweater because there are plenty of other basic sweaters out there. They're perfectly fine. Um, and so I thought, you know, if I'm going to add myself to the mix, and this was three years ago. So there were, I think there are way more designers now than there were three, but if I'm gonna add myself to the mix, I'm gonna add something that's unique. And that became like my standard. So if I had an idea that was like, oh, this is like a really basic chevron, um, I, was, I either needed to scrap it immediately and not think about it, or how can I build upon this so it's something unique. Um, and I want to add a level of interest to um, to to people's options, right? So I remember when I was a hobby knitter that I would see designs that were just so inspiring because it was something I had never thought about before, or it was something that just looked so beautiful and intricate, and I thought I could never do that. And then, but somebody wrote a pattern for me to do that, so can I do it? You know, and that was really what I wanted to share with people. And that really becomes my um, kind of the bar that I set for myself when I think about designs. So, you know, if I want to make a shawl, okay, let's start with the basic shawl, like what shape and what are like the basic textures and then how can I elevate it and make it something that is just that much more interesting. Yeah, yeah. So do you, are all of your patterns self-published or do you work with third-party publishers? All my patterns right now are self-published. Um, I have a couple things in the works later this year. Because that can definitely, I feel like we have pretty similar design processes, um, but that then like puts a twist on my 
creative process because then it's like now I'm rather than just like being completely free to create what I want I'm taking into consideration this publication mm -hmm. they have a whole lot of other considerations to take mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. um so then it, it's a little bit a little bit different for me but have you found that to be true for yourself if you for the couple you have coming up yeah well I think I think the thing that I ran into was there's a cap to like <laughs> how crazy you can get <laughs> um and I was talking to another designer friend of mine and I was kind of like oh I need to get this done for the deadline you know and I was like I just like find myself and I was so excited about this design when I was first thinking about it you know and I was like now I'm just like it's like pulling teeth and she was like it's because it's someone else's thing now you know mm -hmm. And I find that to be, it's so psychological, right? <laughs> I get it, you know, like I'm a therapist, um, my, my real life, um, I get it. You know, as soon, as soon as there is some sort of like, like you're saying third party or like out, outside constraint put on something that feels so fluid, something that feels so, um, so spiritual, right? Then it, it almost, I don't wanna say it kills it, that's really dramatic, but it, it sort of dulls it a little bit, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, it is interesting. So, like, I started off very similar to you as in, like, wanting to have very unique kinds of things. But I realized, or it kind of was a process of realizing, but kind of maybe became really clear to me about a year ago that I wasn't 100% loving using what I designed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I liked designing these um, things that were new and unique and not what other, I was seeing elsewhere, but then I wasn't actually interested in wearing it because my actual style for wearing things is very simple and basic. Mm -hmm. And so it's been interesting for me. I still haven't really found that balance yet. I have a couple designs coming up that I think are doing a lot better of that, but um, like, how do I still create interesting designs that are a creative process for me, but then they're still the kinds of things that I love to wear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel the same, you know, and I think about like the first, my first year of designs and they were things that I loved at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but my, you know, we grow older and our tastes change and, and so now I'm like, I, they're still beautiful in terms of like, this is, this is a, a work of art. Mm -hmm. You can appreciate the, the, you know, the detail and the craftsmanship and all that stuff, but I don't, I don't wear them. Yes. You know? <laughs> um, I, ha I have thought about that in terms of like, like you were saying, like, how do, how do I merge that? And I think it's an, it's really interesting way to evolve whenever you have a, whenever you have a creative practice, right, it, it needs to grow, it needs to evolve, it needs to change, otherwise it's not creative anymore. Yeah. And a lot of what I've been thinking about for this year is how, how do I take what feels unique and put it on something that is wearable? Or how do, how do I, um, how do I merge these or how do I take classic looks, right? Timeless motifs, timeless structure, and how do I put it into something that is also modern, right? Um, and wearable and versatile. And, and honestly, I think a lot of it is, um, has to do with the materials that I use. So I've definitely noticed that my, like my taste in, in yarn um, both for designs and for personal knitting, whenever I get a chance to do that, um, is very, very different from a few years ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then they create different garments and it's a whole different look. Yeah. And also the colors play a, such mm -hmm. a huge role too. That was something else that I started to realize, like, didn't feel like my designs were actually in alignment with me and what I enjoyed was I was using I did a lot of symbolism for a couple of years um so I've also I just had my third design anniversary so <laughs> we've been designing about the same amount of time yeah. uh, 
but the first couple of years I did a lot of symbolism where it was inspired. So like, for example, I had three collections that were location based Montana, where I grew up, North Carolina, where I lived, and then Canada as a super bulky collection that was the neighbors. Um, but then they were very much based on things like trees and forests and mountains and plains and farmland and things like that. And so then I use the colors that then tied into that symbolism. Um, and it made a lot of sense while I was designing it, but mm -hmm. now it's like, all right, what do I do with these things now? <laughs> like, basically I wear gray all the time, <laughs> blue and purple, and these are not my colors with a bunch of orange and, you know, anyway. And so that's been something else that's been really interesting for me, just like trying to navigate what's the difference or the similarities as a designer versus as a knitter. Mm -hmm. And how do those things, how do I want those things to overlap? Because there's, mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong answer to that. But it's really a matter of like, why are you creating these things? And what do you want to do with them, I think? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that's something that I started to think about as well this year. So this year, um, the theme of this year is the Buffalo Rose. Um, so I'll take this off and I'll show you. So I have a, a pattern coming out next week, which is like the first in this series. And it's, um, it's Buffalo plaid with a rose overlay. Mm -hmm. So it's three color shannon color work. It's really cool. It's coming out next Friday. Um, and so I'll have, this is a, a raglan tee and then I'll have pullover for adults and children this fall, and then a hat and a cowl this winter, this coming winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I got so excited about this motif, right? Because it's so cool. I think it's so cool. And I'm really surprised that no one's done it yet <laughs> <laughs> in Portland, Oregon, of all places. <laughs> um, but honestly, like, I don't, I don't wear this kind of stuff anymore. You know, like I'm wearing it now. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'll probably wear it out a few times, especially if I go to like a knitting event, but generally mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting, right? Like, and I know that there are plenty of other knitters who do wear stuff like this all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm designing both for me in terms of like, can I do this? <laughs> can I write the chart for a Buffalo plaid with a rose overlay? Turns out I can. Um, <laughs> can I do that? And can I make it into different shapes? And will people love this? And I think they will. Mm -hmm. And that's what really it's about, you know. Um, the design process for me is far more about start to finish, like inception, um, planning, grading, all that stuff, um, testing, marketing. Um, I actually really love the visuals that go into um, marketing materials and, and actually my pattern document. Like I love all that stuff. And so the actual garment is just a tiny piece of it. Whereas for knitters, the garment is the thing, right? Like that's <laughs> what they're making. And that's what I'm providing for them, you know? And, mm -hmm. and that's very different than me when I see a pattern for something that I wanna make and wear, right? Then it's, then it's the designers are not stuff for me. And I'm like, I just, the, it's just the garments for me. Yes. You know? It's, I, I love that there's such a distinction in what this means as a maker, right? Someone who's making the garment or someone who's making the bones of the garment, you know? And that's really essentially why I started designing in the first place is because I've been knitting for so long. Um, and I started sharing my projects. Like I have a personal Instagram that's private, but I, start, I started this Casey Knitting Co. as just a public knitting account and I started posting more projects and my friends were like, oh, you're so talented. And I was like, no, I'm not. I just follow directions like really well, <laughs> you know? And like the real talent is the people who write the patterns and I could never do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought maybe I could because how, how much longer can I just knit other people's patterns um, if, if I'm wanting to continue to grow creatively, mm -hmm. right? And that also became something important because I, I am a therapist in my real life um, and I have a private practice and it's, being a therapist is a very interesting job <laughs> um, because it's emotional work mm -hmm. and there needs to be a lot of space when you're not working. 
right? Um, so if you have a job where you like go to an office or you log on to Zoom or whatever it is now, you know, it's a it's a very different level of energy output and interaction than sitting with a client, you know. And and my thought was, I I need a lot of space in between. But what is this space going to be spent doing? Like I, I don't I don't really want to just be idly spending this time. Um, and I had always thought. I wanted to have some sort of creative venture, uh, whether or not it made me money, right? I wanted to be doing something that kept building upon itself. Um, and, and designing really is that because it's, it's always changing and I have a lot of freedom in doing it independently. And it is a very different experience than hobby knitting. Yes, yeah, I love that. Okay, can we take few steps back and talk about when you first started knitting like yeah started knitting what your first projects were all that kind of stuff <laughs> I started knitting I th I'm pretty sure it was 2009 um and I was in grad school um I had I so I moved to Portland in 2008 and before that I had about six months off I was living in New York City um had a job that burned me out. I quit and lived at home with my parents for six months before moving out here. Um, and I was like, I'm going to do something fun in Portland. is such a creative city. What can I do? You know, and I started making jewelry um, with the intention to like open up a little Etsy shop when I got here, which I did. Um, but jewelry, jewelry making is not portable. It's not, <laughs> it's not cozy. And it is messy as hell. You know, like, Knitting can be messy, but usually you just pick up your project and you move on, you know, like you can't put all your jewelry making stuff in a project bag and sling it around. You can't do that. And so I would just always have jewelry, like materials and tools and bits and pieces spread out all over the place. And I was like, I want like a cozy, soft craft. <laughs> so I started knitting. Um, but I was just so impatient. Like I didn't want to make, I didn't want to make washcloths. I didn't want to even make a scarf because I don't know. I don't know anyone like all you people who make scarves. Like, I don't know. Why, why do you do that? It's just like, <laughs> anytime I meet a beginner knitter, who's like, I'm knitting a scarf. I'm like, why are you doing that? You're going to hate yourself. <laughs> Makes a towel, you know? So I, I, I'm pretty sure that my first project was probably a cowl or um, I do remember one of the very first projects I made were these like fingerless mitts. Mm -hmm. And then I just got into making hats, um, hats and cowls and baby sweaters. Um, I didn't make an adult sweater for like the first six years of knitting because I was so intimidated um, and impatient, you know, it's like, I'm not going to be working on something for that long. <laughs> <laughs> I love like looking back on maybe learning journeys is the best way to put it. But like the things that seem so hard and impossible, you know, yeah. even a few years ago that once you realize like just some practice and learning more about the craft and things like it's no longer intimidating. Like the, the things that you thought were going to be hard and impossible are now the things that you love. And I just think that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember, so I, I kind of learned a few different times how to knit when I was younger. Um, but when I was in high school, I, I think it took me five or six years to finish, but it was a scarf. <laughs> um, it had, takes so long. <laughs> and every time I picked it up, I couldn't remember if it was a knit, like what a knit was versus a pearl. It was, yeah. just, it was felt like the hardest thing ever. It's like, I'm never going to get anywhere with this. But there was something like when I finished that project, and well, then I also did a matching hat that matched it. That was part of the same pattern. I mean, it was part of the same pattern book. Um, and something about once I finished those two projects, I something clicked where I'm like, oh, now like everything is just knits and pearls, basically. Mm -hmm. Actually, I can do a lot of things. And I was like, I finished this thing and I had like so much confidence. So like, Aww. I can do anything now. So um, anyway, it's just interesting, you know, just the learning process of mm -hmm. like, 
you do have to go through the hard part of learning it, but then after that, it's so much more enjoyable, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's so, so much of it is about, about mastery, you know? And so I do think a lot about, so my kind of tagline is um, knitwear designs for mindful making. Um, I do think a lot about the feelings that we need to have as humans for well-being, you know, mm -hmm. and, and these feelings can come from a lot of things, but they're, but they're all universal. Like, uh, well, so like emotionally, we all need to feel needed. We all need to feel like we belong somewhere. <laughs> um, we, we need to feel useful. Um, and so one of these things that you're talking about is mastery. We need to feel, we need to constantly be achieving mastery. And I say this carefully because we are in such an achievement-based culture that I think leads to a lot of stress and shame and burnout. So it's not that we need achievement in the way that capitalism has taught us, but we do need to achieve a feeling of mastery, meaning we start not knowing something, we struggle through it, and then we come out of it knowing something. Mm -hmm. right? And this is one of the tenets that I try to think about when I'm designing. Um, usually some technique that I include in my pattern is something that somebody hasn't done before. Yes. And they will complain to me about it. <laughs> I say, just try it, you know? And so a great example I can think of right now is the tubular cast on, which is also called the Italian cast on. And I have this in several of my patterns because I like it and I think it creates um, just a little more of a finesse to your cast on. Um, you don't have to use it, right? You don't. Um, <laughs> but you know, for me, I'm like, I've done the long tail cast on 5 million times in my life. I know what it looks like. It creates a nice ridge, whatever. But the tubular cast on is just that much cooler. And there is this sense of like, if you don't know how to do it, um, there's one pattern where I think I, I, I wrote how to do it, but there's also tutorials that I'll always include. Um, try it, right? Try it. You don't know how to do it. Try it. Fail a million times, you know, mm -hmm. and I've experimented with it. So the way that I have found to do it, it involves several different needles, right? So like straight needles, the size down, whatever, play around with it. And then once you do it and it's done and you look at it, it's beautiful, right? And that's mastery. And there is this feeling of accomplishment and, and satisfaction that comes with that. And that's what I really want to encourage. So the next pattern that I'm releasing is three color strand and color work. And it's not intuitive, right? It's not just like a repeating like five stitch motif. They're freaking roses, <laughs> you know, buffalo plaid. It won't be easy. And at the same time, the sense of mastery that you will feel when you finish, when you, when you cut off the third color. <laughs> yes. Right. And, and that is so to me, I think, I mean, I know how it feels. I know it's satisfying for me, but I think it's satisfying for every human, mm -hmm. no matter what it is that they're mastering. Yes. Yes. I love that so much. <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to totally change, change gears. You, <laughs> kind of had you touched on before like how your yarn um preferences have changed over time so mm -hmm. right now what is it that you're you're loving and enjoying working with uh, i'm really on a non-superwash kick this year <laughs> um i made it a goal this year to design only with non-superwash except for the kids stuff um, so that's number one. And I think there's just a different feeling that, that non-superwash yarn has. Um, but that also, I think that it's a relationship with the world around us that is different, you know, and I will say, you know, I continue to love superwash yarn, you know, like when I walk into a yarn store, I'm like, oh, so pretty, you know? <laughs> And I have, and so I have some stash superwash yarn that I've been working with just for like one-off projects. And I'm like, oh man, like I <laughs> just really miss working with this too. Um, so I definitely have an appreciation for it. I think that the, the, the type of colors 
that can show up on single wash yarn. It's just, especially with really talented dyers, just second to none, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of generally my wardrobe, right, and, and kind of what my aesthetic is, my personal aesthetic is, non-superwash, kind of um, more rustic fibers um, or treatments and um, like muted earth tones really seems to be like my jam. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fun. So then when you're knitting from somebody else's pattern, what do you like in a knitting pattern? Like, is it very similar to the kind of stuff you design? It's not. Um, <laughs> I think... I think what I gravitate toward is something that maybe I would never design mm -hmm. right? because then I don't have to think about it and someone just tell me what to do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then how much of your knitting time do you make your designs versus somebody else's designs? Um, it's a majority my stuff. Um, and I've also, I've also really stepped away. So, you know, I, I think I think in 2020 everyone was knitting all the time, um, and then there's been this like gradual, very intentional at times shift away from choosing to spend time knitting for me um, because there is an element of it that can be very obsessive mm -hmm. and addictive, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, but I I on this other kind of like long-term spiritual emotional journey that is really begging for a lot more intentionality and mindfulness and quiet and spaciousness and there is a way that knitting fits into that and then there's also a way that knitting can interrupt that mm -hmm. um so my general knitting time has decreased a lot in the past couple of years so when i do have the opportunity to knit or when i choose to knit i usually need to work on my stuff <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> because I've given myself all these deadlines. Um, but I will say I like allowed myself to pick up um, a personal project that I had abandoned for like over a year, probably. It was a brioche shawl. Um, I will never design anything in brioche. Like I <laughs> cannot, like it, it just blows my mind. So I'm th thankful for all the brioche designers out there who fill that gap um but I I honestly thought I was never going to pick it up again because I was never going to be able to figure out where I left off you know <laughs> um but I was like you know what like this is so beautiful and I'm already halfway through I'm not frogging this um <laughs> so I made myself figure it out and and actually once I got back into the rhythm I remembered you know what that feeling is that feeling of mastery that feeling of rhythm and flow, right? And the real desire to, uh, to complete something. Mm -hmm. And it's total, it's so different knitting from somebody else's pattern. Mm -hmm. Like the work's already done. You get to do the easy part. <laughs> um, it's, it is, it's a very different experience. Even if you've already knit up the pattern and you're working from your own pattern, it still is we still have a different kind of brain mindset on while you're working through it than you do when you're just knitting somebody else's pattern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my struggle is, so I guess back history, I have, I'm, I'm a workaholic, um, <laughs> have been since like middle school. Um, and so I, I keep trying to become more intentional about not working all of the time. Um, and because I wasn't a knitter with a capital K before I started Snickerdoodle Knits, it's often easy for my, even my personal knitting to feel like work <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's like, that's just like the association that I make with it. Or oftentimes it's easy to be like, oh, I'm making something for myself, but I should take pictures and stuff to share with Instagram and all of this stuff because mm -hmm. that's good and, you know, that will be helpful and things right, like that. Right. So it's, it can be difficult for me to turn off that, that work mode with personal knitting. But um, I, I also have a 
I, so yeah, I have a hard time doing personal nets, but I started a cardigan before American Thanksgiving last year. And I'm like this far done with it. <laughs> anyway, um, it's kind of fun because I've been doing a lot Instagram live on my channel, just chatting every Friday. So um, sometimes it's a good excuse to just like knit on somebody else's pattern because it's done and it's ready and mm -hmm. I it. <laughs> it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot less thinking. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so my next question, which you've already talked about, is the fact that you're a therapist. Um, a, do you want to share anything more about that? And B, mm -hmm. how do you think that connects and relates to your work as a designer? Um, yeah, I'll share a little bit more about it. Um, it's hard work. <laughs> um, I do think that it, 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 it's a loaded thing because I love it and it's very much a part of who I am, which I don't know if that's true for all therapists, but it's definitely true for me. Um, and also I think it, as soon as people find out that I'm a therapist, it changes how they see me. Um, <laughs> I don't know how it changes, but I know that it does. Um, but like, I, I often want to be like, you know, the, um, the Us Weekly where they're like, stars, they're just like us. I'm like, therapists, like, they're just like us, they're just <laughs> like you, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it, it definitely has informed a lot of awareness that I have around consumerism um, Instagram, social media, um, and then, um, the kind of undeniable connection between, um, acquisition and like, like I mentioned before, like obsessiveness or addiction, um, and a craft that is so easily proliferated, right? Like we all have a stash, right? And we all joke about stash. <laughs> I will tell you the first time that I found out about the Ravelry uh, flashier stash thing. Um, so quickly for anyone who doesn't know it, every year they have this thread that they open called flashier stash where you just share pictures of your stash. First time I learned about it, I like went on it out of curiosity and was just floored, floored at how much yarn people have. And, and you know, I am not by no means innocent of this. Um, but I never had a stash until I got on Instagram. So I'm like, this is, this is connected, you know, and that this relationship with, with consumerism, with wanting things, with limited edition things, especially with, you know, um, with hand dyers who have limited batch, right? There's this one dyer, my gosh, um, Yama Yarn. Have you heard of her? I, I kind of recognize that, but I can't think of what the yarn so, looks like. Yeah, she's in South Africa. She has just like these gorgeous earth tone, like muted colors, just like beautiful. Um, but she's in South Africa and her, her internet sucks. And so she literally just like, will be like shop update sometime on this day, which is usually between um, like three and 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. I'm like, I'm not staying up for five, you know, for all night just to wait for the shop announcement. Um, but then people do that. People do that because her yarn is so beautiful. Um, and then they get carjacked. Like she sells out in two seconds. And, but, and the shipping from South Africa is like freaking like $50. So, but people want it, right? Mm -hmm. And I have literally thought maybe this is the time I'm going to set my alarm for 3 a.m. and wait. You know, and I'm thinking like, <laughs> you know, um, so I think about this stuff and, and, and I do, I do understand it. And I also, as, as someone who it's my profession to like, to care about human well-being, like I'm always concerned about it. Mm -hmm. I'm always concerned about how we can all be navigating this balance like how how can we still find enjoyment in this how can we still find 
actual joy in being on Instagram, which is where we find all these things, which is where we interact, right? It's just become the place. Um, how do I still feel the joy that I used to feel when I walk into a yarn store? Because it's different now, mm -hmm. you know? It's yeah, it is, like you had mentioned, like this craft can be like an addiction, an obsession. And my first thought before you got into more about social media was for me, it's definitely been fueled by, by social media because it's like all of this stuff where it's like, oh, everybody else has all of this stuff, so I need all of this stuff. Or <laughs> everybody else has 20 projects going on, so I need to hurry up and make a bunch of projects. And mm -hmm. all of these different things where before it was like knitting wasn't that big of a thing in my life. Like I'd make projects for the fun of it, and it was – just another one of my hobbies and I have lots of them and so I don't spend that much time on any of them um and and yeah it's just I think it's really it's interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I remember feeling like um like this pressure to always be knitting mm -hmm. you know and I remember there was a very, very popular designer who put out a newsletter specifically with tips on how to finish all of your projects. I think she had been asked many times, how do you, how do you finish so many projects? And she was like, here are the tips. And some of the, some of the tips were like, fine, you know, um, and others were like, learn how to knit while you walk. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't know do that. But I thought about it, you know. Yes. I'm like, hmm, can I get a cute little fanny pack? You know, and now they have cute fanny packs for knitters. Mm -hmm. Learn how to knit while you walk. Knit at the movies. I'm like, I'm not knitting at the movies, you know. Um, and it's gotten to the point where when I think about knitting, it's almost like, can I knit silently? can I do this without, without TV, without even a podcast, maybe with music, but there have been hours, like I'll get off work, you know, and there's always this period of time where I like want to decompress before um, I go do something else or make dinner or whatever. And sometimes I'll pick up a project and I'll just knit and I'll realize after an hour that I haven't turned anything on. You know, it's just been me and my dog and, and silence and knitting. And I kind of love that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really easy knitters in general, but myself for sure, um, to fall into this trap of like, oh, I can be multitasking when I'm knitting. So like I'm being either my, my knitting is my productive part or the other part is my productive part and I'm knitting. So I'm being double productive, but it's kind of this whole, like you were talking earlier about this whole, our society that we live in is like, you always have to be productive and accomplishing something and doing something amazing. And so for me, it was like when I first kind of got into knitting more, I was like, oh, I can, I can justify doing these other things because I'm knitting at the same time. And so now I'm being productive and I'm getting something done. Um, and I, I don't think that's actually what, for many of us, we actually, is our purpose of knitting? Um, like, is, is the purpose actually to be, just to be pumping stuff up out and be overly productive and, or is it actually to be more mindful and calm and because that's that's a very different kind of mindset it's like i have to get stuff done i'm gonna do this really fast i'm gonna get loads done versus i'm just gonna sit and relax and enjoy every stitch and be mindful about what i'm creating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> you know, i'm thinking I mean, is there any other craft that you can do like that you know like, I could never make jewelry while I was walking. <laughs> <laughs> or, like, painting or <laughs> sewing. Or... And so there's something about the relative portability of knitting that has lent it to become this type of activity when 
it may not have been meant to be. Ooh, and I'm thinking about like, um, if you think about like very, very like classic knitting pieces, you know, they're usually seamed. Mm -hmm. And so it, there's really isn't like, it, it is something that you sit and you make and then you put it together and you sit at a table, right? Like, don't seem in your lap, guys. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's a disaster waiting to happen. But there, there, the like kind of the 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 foundation of the craft, maybe it was more similar to other sorts of crafts. Mm -hmm. um, and then what it's become, and you know everything changes, everything evolves. What it's become has been inserted very handily into this fast paced uh, production oriented culture. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we forget then we forget the foundation and we forget its history. Yes. Yes. I love that so much. I feel like we could keep talking. Like, <laughs> I have so many things I feel like I relate with you on. Um, and I'm still only on like question three from my list. <laughs> um, Okay, one more question before we, oh, two more questions before we get into seeing more of your designs. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to ask, what are you most passionate about in the fiber arts world? What am I most passionate about in the fiber arts world? I really think it's helping people understand their own relationship with with knitting, you know, with their craft. Mm -hmm. You know, I we're so swayed by messaging. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely am too. You know, like there are times when I see certain designers on Instagram, and I think, oh, they're doing that. I'm not doing that. And then I'm like, wait, I have another job. <laughs> right? Like I literally don't have time to yep. do what I'm doing. Yep. Um, but what is everyone's own personal relationship with it? And, and how can, how can this be a, a craft or a hobby or a practice or however you want to consider it um, that, enhances your life rather than um, rather than becomes another coping mechanism, right? Like coping mechanisms mm -hmm. are fine, um, but they're, they're actually not, they're meant to be temporary, right? And so there's this constant wish that I have for people to settle into an actual relationship with whatever they're doing in their lives, but with knitting, like what's your relationship with knitting? Mm -hmm. How do you, how can you engage with it rather than having it feel like it controls you? Yes. Yes. Of yeah. that. And like, it's personal. It, do it doesn't need to look like anybody else's mm -hmm. knitting. It, mm -hmm. it can you um, just reminds me of a couple different, examples like for myself I struggled for quite a while with like feeling like I'm not a real knitter or a real designer because um I I don't always just want to be knitting like <laughs> sometimes there's other things I want to do mm -hmm. and alongside those lines is like when people are like out hiking and things like that like no, I'm not actually going to knit while I'm hiking. Like, <laughs> if I bring it for me, it's for it would be for a picture for Instagram, and that is, <laughs> uh, like, um. And so I've actually come like where I'm. I say more and more often just on my Instagram, like, it's okay if you don't knit all the time. It's okay if you don't feel like knitting. It's okay if you don't bring your knitting with you every single place you go. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, it was just like trying to justify myself, but also sharing that message with other people who feel that pressure mm -hmm. around them. So. Um, okay, so then I wanted to talk real quick about your other hobbies outside of um, designing and knitting. You kind of shared some from when you were younger, but I have a list here that you already shared with me. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about some of your other interests outside of 
this world? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, one of my big interests, I guess, is my, is my dog. Um, and she's, she's been, she's been really great for me and just like establishing structure in my life. Um, and so we spent a lot of time running, um, or being outside walking, um, trying to, trying to find places in nature where I feel like I can let her off leash and she won't like freak out or run away. Um, and so I guess that's a hobby. Um, yeah. I do really like cooking. Um, and when I, when I have, when I feel like I have a mental space, I really like to experiment with different flavors, different recipes. So my favorite thing to do is if I like had something in a restaurant that I really liked, um, I'll try to recreate it at home. Um, and so either I'll just like try to do it from what I know about flavors or I'll look up some recipes and just like kind of like meld them together and see what happens. <laughs> um, I, so I did, I did Boulder for a long time, um, from like 2015 to 2020. Um, and then with the pandemic and everything, I stopped doing that. And I just recently started again. Um, and it's very quickly become back part of my routine, which is really interesting because I don't think that it was so much a part of my routine when I was knitting a lot. So it really has been this give and take, right? Like, so there's an evening that I have free Am I going to go to the gym or am I going to sit and knit? And usually I go to the gym, you know. Um, and there's there's a lot more to say about bouldering and how it also, like, is a parallel to um, kind of mental health and, and kind of reaching the pinnacle of your well-being. Um, but I'll just leave it at that's something I spend a lot of time doing. Um, and it's it's interesting, like, when I started, when I first started bouldering, I was like, am I going to be able to knit if I'm like constantly like working my arms and hands to the bone? The answer is yes. How <laughs> They work different enough muscle groups <laughs> that it is possible. <laughs> um, um, and then you also sometimes like writing poetry, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you share it on your Instagram? much um no i so i have shared a few of my personal instagram it's a lot of it is for kind of my own healing um there so it, it come, kind of comes in waves so right now a lot of what i'm writing is more kind of long form um but there was a time when i ran a poetry night like a, a spoken word poetry night um, locally. And that was probably one of the like most interesting times of my adult life where I just was like, I was running the show, you know, and I created a space for a community and people loved it. And it, I did it for, I don't know, almost a year maybe. Um, and there's always a thought that I have of like, how, how can I make this something accessible for others right like is this something that will help others <laughs> or is this something where i just want to like show people so they can be like wow you're such a good writer <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah that's so cool um so is that is poet writing poetry part of like a regular practice as well is it or is it something that kind of comes and goes as you're inspired or yeah, it kind of comes and goes. I sort of just listen to when there's a lot of, maybe there's a lot of words or there's maybe a lot of um, some sort of energy that wants to come out in that form. And then I'll kind of listen to it. And other times I'm like, mm, I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, like when you, you keep it to yourself, it feels like then there can also be less pressure to keep creating you know, like, sometimes when you start to share something, and people enjoy it, it can feel like there's pressure to keep creating that thing, even when you're not inspired to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely felt that way. <laughs> um, and then the last thing that you had mentioned was that you started an acapella group. I did. Cool. <laughs> many, so, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> do you still sing a lot? Um, no, I mean, I'll do karaoke. I used to do a lot of karaoke um, before the pandemic and when I was a little bit younger, like, you know, mid to late 20s, I think. Um, 
I was doing a lot and karaoke is a big thing in Portland. So mm -hmm. there's like always an opportunity to do it. Um, and so that was really mostly where I got that out. And there's, there's a certain like performance aspect of it that I really enjoyed that like, I don't enjoy in my real, my real life. So like karaoke is like my karaoke life. Um, but yeah, so, so now, and, and now like we've gotten back into doing karaoke, but we do like private room karaoke because, um, we're a lot older now. <laughs> Yes. So I, I love what you just mentioned about like, it being like your karaoke life. I love that like when we have multi passionate and we have all these different interests, it's like, we really can take a look at different parts of our personality and accept that, you know, like, there are different parts of us that shine in different environments. And that like, that's okay. You don't have to be like, a static person that shows up the same way in every situation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, let's go ahead and get into your designs. First of all, um, how do you describe your designs? Like if somebody were asking you what kind of things you create, how would you describe it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> interesting things for intermediate knitters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you wanna show us? Um, well, do you have your your poncho design? That's what you said was probably your yeah. favorite. Yeah. So this is the tender wood. Um, I'm especially so it's a cowl neck, which I never know if I should show the. Okay, so cowl neck, and then it's a pretty classic color work motif, um, and it has like this triangle shaping, and it has this cool. I like this cool like column down mm -hmm. you see it down the front mm -hmm. um it is three color stranded <laughs> um but you can get away with a lot of duplicate stitch for some of the third color um the reason this is my favorite is because it was one of my earlier designs before i felt very confident in a lot of shaping and i was just like messing around and i wanted to make a poncho because like ponchos are so cool um <laughs> And I, and I knew I wanted a, like a big cozy poncho. And I, I was like, I think this will work with the shaping. I think this will work. And it worked. And not only did it work, but then it was like freaking amazing. You know, <laughs> um, just so many aspects of it were this kind of intuitive but experimental mindset that I think is so important with creativity because you have to take risks, you know? You have to take risks. And, and since this, since the Tenderwood, um, <laughs> I've taken other risks in design. Some of them have failed miserably, right? And like, um, probably two of my favorite design stories are there are two designs that I've cut in half because they didn't work. Like I finished a sample and then I was like, oh no, I'm going to renew this whole thing. So I literally cut it in half to like redo it. Yep. And that's kind of the level of experimentation that like, I think you have to be okay with um, if you want to challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's this, you know, especially when you're doing it as a business and stuff, there's this dichotomy between wanting to be efficient and, you know, like trying to reduce the amount of time that it takes to design the pattern and, you know, all of these things. Um, but then at the same time, that that doesn't actually <laughs> go that well with the whole creative aspect because mm -hmm. that is a whole process that you have to like, like it, it, it isn't necessarily efficient <laughs> to cut. I've also cut apart my design and, <laughs> and you know, re-knit the top half and then decided I didn't like it and re-knit the top half again. And um, anyway, um, so it is, it's, it's interesting especially you know for folks that are are trying to make it an income and things like that it's 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 interesting i don't i don't know what else to say about it <laughs> i think about it as like as as learning as school right like if you were going to get a degree in knitting design i'm sure that at some point you would be struggling with something right and that you would maybe spend a lot of time on something and when you're in school there's no expectation that you should be making money 
right? You're, you're in there to, to learn and fail and grow and all those things. And mm -hmm. as an indie designer, you don't necessarily go to school or if, you know, you, you can take ad hoc, ad hoc classes, but there's no school, there's no program, mm -hmm. official program. And so a lot of people learning on their own. And that's what I was doing was I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll learn how to cut knitting in half. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I got really good at Kitchener's too. You know, like, it's just what you do. Yeah. And it's like with any sort of learning. And, you know, again, like to tie in like therapy, like I talk to a lot of my clients about just trying new ways of, of being. Mm -hmm. right? The way that you're being isn't working for you, which is why you're here. So try a new way of being. Mm -hmm. And it might feel weird or it might not work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can always change again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what other designs do you have with you to show us? Um, I have my Willa cowl. Yes. So this is, it looks like free color color work, but it is not. It's <laughs> only two colors at a time. Um, but you do use um, a, one main color and three contrast colors, and you just alternate them. And actually, um, I'm going to be doing a knit along with a yarn store in New Jersey um pretty soon here i think we're going to start it in may and emily of woolen palette who is the dyer that i worked with for this um she's going to be coming up with different um, palettes for spring um so it'll be a really cool opportunity if you haven't made one to make one um <laughs> and to have some more spring colors to choose from so and the willa and then um, this is my very first design, burgeoning. So pretty. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely like, when I said that I wanted my designs to be like interesting and like not easy, that's, this is my first color. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also was like really amazed that I made a tank top and it worked. <laughs> um, and then this is Rhodes End. This, I released this last summer. Um, it's probably time for me to start showing it again on Instagram for like seasonal. Um, but it's, it's this cool kind of fade color work. It's also only two colors at a time. Um, just a really cool little tank top. I like it a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll show this one. Um, this is T. So this is a mock neck cropped. Um, so there's two fits that I wrote it for. This is the boxy fit and then there's a fitted fitted fit. Um, <laughs> and this, this is my most successful pattern to date. And um, I wanted to specifically show this today because it's called T, T-H-I, and it's named after my sister-in-law um, who just had her second baby um, last week. And it was a pretty difficult birth. So I just wanted to honor her um, and show her some love. Yeah. And um, she's an incredible woman. And I was, I was so happy to um, write a pattern and design a top for her. Um, and then to also have that be the most successful pattern to date. I just think it means so much to me and to her so yes sending her sending her and her new baby lots of love yes so sweet I love that I love I always love when designs have stories and, and you you get to because it it just adds I guess a layer of connect connection um like just understanding things on a little bit deeper level and just gives mm -hmm. them and value and you can appreciate it just that little bit more <laughs> and I always want to think of what I'm doing as as art right and um so again to contrast with you know somebody who's building a collection of basics right like that's just not what I'm doing mm -hmm. and I don't I don't um is can there be a story behind something can there be a reason that I'm putting another thing into the world right and can there be a can there can there be some sort of emotional journey that is honored every time somebody buys the pattern, reads the pattern, and kind of makes you know 
they make something out of it, right? And there are all these teas running around, right? They're <laughs> all over, they're all over the place. And, um, and each time I see it, I think, you know, this was something that I created in honor of somebody who's very special. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love it. Okay, now tell us a little bit more again of, about your new design coming out. Okay, so it's called the Buffalo Rose Tea. It's a collaboration with Forest Lane Fiber Co who I think um, is doing awesome things for non-superwash yarn, um, especially because her, her eye for color and her hand with dyes are, is just amazing. So you've got the combination of sourcing really great wool um, and then making it look beautiful and unique. Um, I'll stand up again. So it is a short sleeved rabbit um, buffalo plaid motif with a rose overlay. Um, and let's see, it'll be coming out next Friday and there will be, so I think Larissa and I are talking about both having some, um, not necessarily like kits available, um, but having some color combos that you can choose from or choosing from a la carte. So the yarn that I used is her Rambouillet Sport which is so cool. It's so, um, it's so toothy and also like really light. Um, so I think it's really important to understand the sort of fibers that we use with certain designs. So because this is three color stranded color work, like you probably want to use a, a wool and spun. Like <laughs> you don't want to use a five ply. Like you, just, <laughs> you don't, um, because it's a spring weight top. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, look out for that. I'll probably start, um, promoting it next week, um, in, in time for the release on Friday. So fun. So exciting. Um, and then just in general, there's folks from my audience watching, where can they find you? Uh, my Instagram handle is KC Knitting Co. And then my website is kcknittingco.com. And my Ravelry name is Casey Newton Co. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much easier when they actually all yeah. line up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. We you know, talked even longer than the hour. So I uh, really appreciate you being here and sharing so much. Like a, kind of a peek into your world and what is behind the designs of Casey Knitting Co. Yeah, so. thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was so such a welcoming host. It's oh. so, it definitely didn't feel like over an hour. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, and then oh, I hope that someday we will meet up in person because you okay. live close to my in-laws. So it should happen eventually. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks to everybody who joined live. If you're just copying on now, the replay will be up in just a few minutes. So thanks again and have a good end to your week. Bye. Bye.